Excellent. So hello, uh, my name is Peter Van Valkenburg. I'm from Coin Center, as Agalos just told you. Um, a little background first. Uh, what is Coin Center and what do we do? So our main goal really is to help along this process, which we've identified as something that's definitely happening in cryptography, in IT, in social governance systems, this desire to decentralize all the things and hopefully reap the social benefits that we can get from that, whether they're improved transparency, security, um, equality amongst participants in these systems, all of these sorts of things. What we really are, though, is a Washington, D.C.-based think tank um, that tries to be a voice for decentralized computing technologies. So like the early internet, nobody owns uh, the Bitcoin network. It is created by the cumulative acts of all of its participants, the scribes, the miners. Um, and there is not necessarily a single voice that can be an interface for the existing governance systems of the world, things like governments. So this is why we're based in Washington, DC. Um, I think I'll have no trouble getting back across the border, I hope, but I won't tell them about my brain wallet and the amount of money I have in my head. Um, and we have a full-time professional staff. We have uh, three lawyers on staff, uh, a communications person and an admin person who are all lovely. Um, we have support from key uh, players in the industry, uh, people who are developing the technology, exchanges, uh, some of the businesses, but actually more than half of our support comes from individuals who are highly generous and willing to, um, to try and help an organization stand up and, and speak to government about the technology in a way that doesn't immediately jump to dark markets and the Silk Road and things like that. And what we really do is three things uh, for policymakers and also the media, uh, education, policy research and advocacy. And I'll explain a little bit of what that looks like. So we have a series of backgrounders on our website which are 2,000 words or less um, in plain English, not in technical English, um, that explain something discrete within the community. So a, a backgrounder, for example, on, on what does a company actually do to take control of Bitcoins? At what point do they have control of Bitcoins from a physical standpoint? What, what does that look like? Of course, it involves private key possession, but how else does that work? Um, how anonymous is Bitcoin really? Actually not very anonymous, quite transparent, probably not private enough. Um, how can law enforcement actually analyze the blockchain in order to find those that they deem criminals and in investigate them? Um, we also have a series of longer form reports which will look at a discrete technical issue and how it intersects with an existing body of law. So for example, Securities regulation is, an, is, a, is a fairly large issue in the United States with respect to the issuance of new tokens that travel on these blockchains. We have a report that details our analysis of why several tokens that are issued on blockchains actually do not qualify under existing legal interpretation as securities. And therefore, the fact that they've been issued and sold without registration with the SEC to American citizens uh, is not actually a violation of US securities law, which is a very uh, uh, elaborate argument to make, but I think actually a very good faith argument um, in, in, in many cases. In some cases, these things really are uh, unlicensed securities. Um, additionally, the trouble that companies have had getting banking relationships from the legacy banking system, uh, issues of consumer protection that are more specific to the United States. And finally, we do regulatory filings. So we've talked to the OCC in the US, we've talked to ESMA in, uh, in the EU, uh, and we do uh, frequently have testimony in front of Congress or in front of international organizations um, to help explain the technology to people who are interested. Um, and really, we love open network blockchain technology. And I say that specifically because it's important because as um, Wences Caceres, who is the, uh, the founder of Zappo, has started saying, uh, a lot of bankers and people in government seem to have have been developing a speech impediment lately. When they go to try and say the word Bitcoin, it comes out as b -b 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 blockchain. <laughs> and blockchain is left sort of undefined as sort of like the, the, the more uh, sanitized version of the technology, which, yeah, Bitcoin has a blockchain in it, but we could take the blockchain out of Bitcoin and make it cleaner, make it safer. Um, this is something that we've been encountering more and more lately. 
and which is why Coin Center very much wants to stand up for the open blockchain networks, not just blockchain technology as some vague amorphous concept, but specifically the open networks where anyone can participate, where anyone can be a scribe, where the whole world basically can have cooperative ownership over this thing rather than it being a, a, an identified few who can partake in the consensus mechanism. And I'll explain that a little bit because our first part of my presentation here is what is blockchain when it's, when it's described in the abstract, when we're not talking about Bitcoin's blockchain. And this follows on well to the last two presentations because I'll start to preview some of the, the newer developments in this space, some of the newer networks and some of the newer capabilities on these networks, um, and some of the planned roadmaps for Bitcoin as well. So the word blockchain is unfortunately a lot like the word vehicle. Um, and unlike the word vehicle, however, no one will ever come up to you and say, hey, how do you feel about vehicle? Or, I know, I can find the solution to this problem if we use vehicle. And we might talk about vehicle technology in a sort of abstract sense, but even that would be a very strange discussion. We should probably have a conversation like, oh, you, you could take a bus or there's Uber. Talking about vehicle without any qualifiers or descriptors is not very useful, but people do it all the time with blockchain. Oh, we'll just use blockchain. We'll fix it with blockchain. There is no the blockchain any more than there is the vehicle. And this category blockchain technology is, is almost hopelessly broad at this point uh, in, in marketing. Now there's one thing we know definitely is blockchain technology and that is Bitcoin. That is the running global network that Agalos described so well. And I can say this with authority that that is definitely blockchain technology because the word blockchain was itself invented in order to describe the ledger of all Bitcoin transactions. But since Bitcoin's invention, there have been a number of follow-on innovations which have frequently borrowed either directly some code from the Bitcoin core code base or have built upon the research concepts that have, that have been brought up by the, the creation of Bitcoin. And there, there's a whole number of individuals, companies, for-profits, non-profits, uh, who have developed these new networks and these new tools, and they all fall under this subheading, or this heading, blockchain technology. But what do they all really do? Aside from having been inspired by or built by technology related to Bitcoin, what, what can we say about this vague category? Well, all blockchain technologies will always have these three essential components. I'm gonna say that. Now, I think if they're missing one, I don't think we should call them a blockchain technology, but maybe that would be contentious. But I think most of those logos you saw on the previous page will fit this description. They have a peer-to-peer -peer network. They have a consensus mechanism. And yes, they do have a blockchain, which I would describe as a hash-linked data structure. Now, you might say, okay, well, well Peter, w why do we call it blockchain technology if that's just one of the three? And I think it comes down again, as I said, and Wences has hinted at before, it comes down to branding and, and optics. Um, because peer-to-peer -peer networks, well, we know what that is, that's piracy. <laughs> now, of course it's not, but a lot of people jump to that. Consensus mechanism sounds like something that eggheads in like a, a, a small room in MIT might talk about, but nobody is really interested in. And blockchain, ooh, well that looks new and it sounds Sounds very exciting, and we could probably get behind that. At least it sounds better than cryptography, which sounds like it happens in the basement of a church or something. <laughs> so using these three components to describe what these technologies do is, I think, very helpful because it, it, it lays it out more clearly. And it's because we can actually use these three components to write a sentence that describes what blockchain technologies always do. They allow connected computers, peer-to-peer -peer connected, to reach an agreement over, via a consensus mechanism, some shared data, which may be in the form of a blockchain, of a hash-linked data structure. Again, connected computers reach agreement over shared data. All of these technologies uh, purport to do that or are being developed in order to do that. And of course, Bitcoin does that. 
Now looking specifically at, at how exactly Bitcoin does that will hopefully make my sentence more clear and, and help you understand. So who are the connected computers in the Bitcoin network? Well, they're really anybody who chooses to run on their device Bitcoin compatible software. So if I download a software wallet product onto my phone and it generates Bitcoin addresses to which you can send me Bitcoin if I held up a QR code here, which I swear I'm going to do one day, so maybe I can you know, make little on the side. If I do that, this computer is one of the connected computers that is coming to agreement over the state of the ledger. Now, there's, there's complications here from a technological standpoint because this is not what we would call a full node. It's not mining. It's not one of the scribes. But this is a device that has credentials on it that authorize it in order to send messages, which the scribes will then incorporate into the blockchain. But you can also imagine an open network running on, on this device. In fact, I could run a full node on this device, I believe. Uh, I wouldn't be very successful at mining because this device is not very powerful. But there are also other open networks with different proof of work algorithms, different dice, if you will, where perhaps one day we'll be able to have better even cell phone based, smartphone based mining. So the connected computers are any device running Bitcoin software. And a lot of people don't trust themselves to run this sophisticated software. This gets to the question that, that Burkhardt's uh, excellent talk teed up, which was how, how do I know as an individual that I'm doing this right? I'm not sophisticated. I can't audit the code. Well, in this case, lots of people are, are they feel like they're not sophisticated enough to, to make sure that they're adequately securing their credentials to spend their Bitcoin. So if you lost your phone, what happens? Are you out of luck if you were keeping the credentials on your phone? And for that, we have a number of companies who have now specialized basically in holding keys for other people. You can think of them as basically a Bitcoin bank. But the other thing they do is, is they operate a, a warehouse full of servers, if you will, that are participating in the consensus. And these are, of course, what most of the larger mining companies now do, things like Bitfury and, and such. Now, who, uh, how is the agreement reached? How does this consensus mechanism uh, part of the three work with respect to Bitcoin? Well, you can think of a consensus mechanism as simply rules in software that promote agreement. So what are these rules in the Bitcoin core software that help the network come to an agreement over which scribe has written the latest page and what is a valid entry in the page on, uh, that, 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 that that scribe produced? Well, of course, there are far more than just these two rules for agreement in the Bitcoin consensus rules. And of course, they are not written in human language. They are written in a language that machines would understand. But these are a good way to, to condense and think about some of the rules. So this first one is nobody can send Bitcoins that they've not first received from someone else. So if you want to add a transaction to a particular block or a page of the book, you need to reference somewhere in the previous pages of the book a transaction where you were the recipient. You can't just send Bitcoins out of thin air. And then the second rule is a way of describing how we pick the scribe every 10 minutes. Um, Agalos's presentation is a much better metaphor for thinking about that with them all playing dice and such. But you can also think of it in the second condensation. Every 10 minutes or so, one of the connected computers will be selected to choose the order of valid transactions for that 10 minute period. That is the scribe who gets to set the new page in the book and set the order of transactions in that page. Finally, what's the shared data that all the computers are agreeing over in Bitcoin? Well, of course, it is this hash link data structure that we call a blockchain. And what it has inside of it is a list of transactions. So this is a very simplified version. You can see Mark sent Ruben one Bitcoin, Mark sent Robin one Bitcoin. In reality, there are millions of transactions currently on the Bitcoin blockchain, um, which has been operating since 2009. And of course, in reality, they don't have human names attached to them. They have Bitcoin addresses, which are random looking but unique numbers, effectively, that correspond one to one with a credential, which we call a private key. And you must sign a message digitally with that private key in order to spend in the future in order the transaction message be valid and added to blockchain. So what about other blockchain technologies, you might say? Well, there's a few things that can differ. But they'll always do these three things. They'll always allow connected computers 
to reach agreement over some shared data. Now, the data is one of the things that can change, of course. So instead of transactions in a token called Bitcoin, we could potentially have identity credentials of some sort. And this could be a digital type of identity, like the domain name system. So we have a registry that exists globally in different places that is held by different corporations that describes whether an IP address, which looks like a bunch of numbers, is the IP address that is registered by the name google.com. And that resolves the name google.com when people type it into a URL, uh, into their web browser, to the servers that Google, the company, is maintaining. That is just identity data related to, to machines. We could put that identity data, instead of having it in the trust of a few corporations globally, uh, or non-governmental organizations like ICANN ICAN and things like that, instead of having to trust those centralized entities, we could put that data onto a blockchain. We could put votes potentially onto a blockchain of sorts. And we had an excellent presentation just previously describing some of the issues surrounding that. We could put permissions to open smart locks and turn on smart light bulbs onto a blockchain. Now, why would we do that? Well, because right now, if you actually are bold enough to install a bunch of smart devices in your home, you're ceding a fair amount of control over the devices in your home, like light bulbs or locks and things like that, likely to a centralized server probably in Cleveland. And the information security practices of whoever's maintaining that building in Cleveland or in Singapore or wherever the servers are located. Um, why not have that, which is another sort of identity data category, really. It's just who is a user on this IoT network, Internet of Things network, and what is a device on this network, and which users can control which devices. Again, data that could be transactional in nature, like Bitcoin transactions, and could be massively replicated and stored on connected computers all over the world without a centralized choke point, potentially. Records of securities transactions. So you could actually track shares of Apple computer, for example, and who has sold a share of Apple computer to who else using a decentralized data structure and a consensus mechanism. Property records for actual real estate title, interbank settlement records, provision of digital goods, um, and automatic payments for those provision of digital goods. So there's a very interesting an exciting project called Filecoin, which is a, this is a very poor and jargony summary of what they're, they're thinking of doing, basically allowing anyone to donate their surplus storage capacity for data storage to this decentralized network and automatically be remunerated for providing lively and accessible and reliable storage to people who want to buy it from them. All of that is, again, information relating to a transactional market that you could put on a decentralized ledger on a blockchain, if you will. Now, what else can differ in various blockchain technologies is the nature of the consensus mechanism. And this can, these, these differences can be divided into three general categories of difference, if you want to think about them. So these are really rules and design choices. And when you look at these, you shouldn't say, oh, that's a good one and that's a bad one, because that's like saying, this is a good vehicle, this is a bad vehicle. If you traveling to a Greek island, you probably want a ferry or an airplane. If you're just going down the street, you might just walk, or maybe you use a Segway or a cab or something like that. You know, these are just design choices to meet particular use cases. But here they go. So one of the big distinctions is whether the network is open, like the internet, or closed, like a company intranet. Actually, I think I have a different version here whether the network is open like the internet or closed like a company intranet. So these open networks, and as I said, Coin Center is particularly um, fond of advocating for these open technologies, will be things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, <coughs> Zcash. There are a number that have emerged um, since Bitcoin, the original in 2009. And then there are closed systems where in order to participate in the consensus mechanism, you can't just install software and start rolling dice. You can't, as Agalos said, go down to the computer store and buy dice to participate. You can't do that. You have to actually be identified by some sort of legal entity who will provision you with an access token, an authorization to participate. And only those who have been identified in the real world and authorized to participate can join this consensus mechanism. And these are things like what you may have heard uh, being developed by R3CEV. 
a consortia of some 60 or so international banks who are thinking of using a consensus mechanism, in this case a closed one, where every bank will have an access token, an identity legally on the network, in order to have all the banks come to an agreement over financial contracts being sent between them for the settlement of interbank transfers and things like that. Also other examples, Symbian, Axoni, there are a number as well of these permissioned or closed blockchain um, technologies. The next rule and design choice we can think about here is privacy versus transparency. Now, as we've talked about uh, throughout the day, there will always have to be some level of transparency for these networks to work. Because what these networks really do is take this information we all need to trust, redundantly store it in a number of unaffiliated participants' machines for safety, for redundancy, and also independently verify. So a number of unrelated participants, strangers, the public, if you will, validate the new blocks, validate the transactions in those new blocks to say, yes, this is, all, this is all real, this isn't fraud. So there has to be some level of public transparency in order to have trust in the system. Bitcoin falls on an extreme side of that transparency versus privacy trade-off, actually. Bitcoin is somewhat famed for being an anonymous currency or the, the currency of people in, in the shadows or what have you. But in reality, it's very not private. It's very open. Transaction messages are not encrypted, despite what you'll read in, in, in the misguided headlines or opening paragraphs of, 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 of newspaper publications. The transaction messages are in plain text. And they say, this person sent to this person this many Bitcoins, basically. Now, it doesn't have this person's name, but it has the pseudonym, the address for which they've been the recipient of a payment in the past. And it has the pseudonym of the person who they're sending a payment to. Now, if you can identify that Peter Van Valkenburg is that guy who's got X12597 whatever as their Bitcoin address, then you actually have a, a basically in, unimpeachable record of all the transactions I've made with that address as a third party, as a, as a person who I've not actually decided to share that information with. So it's very not private. Now that's actually quite good for certain use cases. For example, we may want that level of transparency when we're doing things for public purposes, when we're actually saying this is, this'll be, these will be the people who've, who've supported this nonprofit organization. We want to make sure that everybody knows who's actually behind this nonprofit organization and make sure that they've only received money from identified persons or something like that. But in other cases, this is probably too transparent. And there are many efforts underway to make Bitcoin's blockchain less transparent, basically, because it's very not private right now. On the subject of less transparent, more private blockchain technologies, R3CEV actually makes some interesting statements from time to time in white papers and such about how their system for banks will be more private. Because banks actually have some issues here. If you're JP Morgan and they are Goldman Sachs or whoever, you don't necessarily want to air all your financial uh, transactions to your competitor. That's considered proprietary information, trading strategies, um, you know, clients, information you'd rather not have your competitor have. So how are you going to get them all to agree to use a blockchain if they actually need to be transparent now with the other banks in the consortia? Well, our three solution here is to basically only share that consensus data with the computers, the nodes, who need to actually know it. Now, the trade-off here is you've created a little private secure perimeter within your blockchain technology network. And as long as nobody who's unauthorized doesn't get through that security perimeter, it will be private. But you've also done something else. You've now made that transaction probably only verifiable by those two parties, not necessarily by any other parties on the network. And finding a way to keep that data private to those parties while still having third-party verification is a really tricky thing to do with cryptography cryptography and science. And so that is a good segue to the far left of this graph, which is Zcash. Zcash is one of a few open blockchain networks that have been developed, inspired by Bitcoin, that manages to find ways to basically encrypt the transactional data, but still allow the miners on the network, the scribes, if you will, to run a function on that encrypted data that will say some things with certainty about the encrypted data. The function will say, 
We don't know anything about that transaction. It looks like ciphertext. It's garbage. But we can say, because we can run that garbage through a function, that that transaction did not invent any new coins. It did not artificially inflate the currency against the rules of the protocol. What it cannot see is who sent it, how much was sent, or who received it. But it can say that this was a valid transaction in the sense that it didn't create inflation. And that's actually quite radical. The way they use uh, the technology they use to do this is pretty high science, and it is fairly untested to some extent, but they're called zero knowledge proofs. It's a proof of something that releases zero extraneous knowledge about that information. It's very interesting. And Zcash potentially makes this less of an iron law between data privacy and transparency. Maybe it isn't entirely an iron trade-off. Maybe we can have privacy on these blockchain technology networks, but still have full auditability for the information that we want audited, not the private information that we want uh, protected. And then the final rule and design choice that's worth discussing is related to openness, um, related to open versus closed mechanisms, but somewhat different, and, a, and an important way to think about what these technologies do. Blockchain technologies, if they do one thing more than anything else, is push the power and security on an information system to the edge of the network. So think of Facebook. When you find your friends on Facebook and you write them messages, the power and security in that information system sits at the center. It is the servers that Facebook, as a corporation, runs. They have the power to erase everything you've ever said on Facebook, to say things on your behalf that you never said on Facebook. Now, they won't do this because they damage their reputation, but they do have that power. And if they get hacked, any information that you thought you used Facebook to keep private just between you and your small circle of friends, any of that data could become fully public. The power, again, and the, and the, and the responsibility for security falls to a party that sits in the center of the network. Now, blockchain technologies, especially the open ones like Bitcoin, they move the power to the edge of the network. So it looks like this. If I, if I do install that software wallet on this phone and have you send me some Bitcoin, you know, anybody, anybody who wants to, and then I say, thank you. That was an excellent demonstration. Thank you for the, for the half Bitcoin. And then you say, OK, Peter, I'd like the Bitcoin back now. The demonstration is over. And I say, no, I don't want to. This device is the only device on the network, assuming that the keys were generated properly, but that's not a terrible assumption to make. This device is the only device on the network that can actually reverse the transaction. There's no Bank of America sitting in the middle saying, yeah, Peter just you know, pulled a fast one on his audience. We'll reverse that transaction. Or a credit card network like Visa that can reverse. This is the only device on the network that can send you your money back. And so if I throw it out the window, well, then I've done something silly, because then potentially if I didn't have a backup of my keys, the money's gone. But you're not getting it back either. I don't know why I just got so antagonistic, but I... <laughs> this is what money does to people. So various blockchain technologies will, at various levels, push the security and the power on the network to the edges. And those closed ones, I've heard people who have talked about building a a closed or a permissioned blockchain technology who will say things like, it will be a consensus of one. I don't know if that's that different than Facebook, really. If it's a consensus of one or if there's only one full node on the network, that sounds to me like you built a database. But maybe it can grow. Maybe, maybe the point is, oh, we're, we're going to start with one, and it'll be compatible and work well. And if we add more in the future, it'll be more of a blockchain technology. Um, so I don't mean to be unfair to people who are working in this field. Um, now, there are some areas where we believe at Coin Center open consensus mechanisms, things like Bitcoin, things like Ethereum, are critical for social good. And this is one of our big messages to policymakers when we talk to a regulator in Washington, D.C., for example. Why, why, should I, why, should I, why should I allow this technology to continue to flourish? Why should I make laws that would promote you know, this technology's ability to flourish? 
why should I do that, especially when all the news is about the Silk Road and people selling drugs to other people on the internet? Why? why? Maybe I just want the closed technology where all the parties are identified beforehand and provisioned with access tokens. Well, there are some things that that closed technology I don't think we'll ever be able to deliver in a safe and secure way. And these are some very important things. And these are things like electronic cash. And you may say, well, maybe we don't need cash. Maybe we can just have you know, bank account money. Well, we've you know, had a couple experiments already with that, demonetization in India being one of the most recent and glaring examples. And there are human rights implications. And there are issues of autonomy and privacy that are involved when you decide to go to a cashless society. And I don't think we've had a rich enough debate to say that we are ready for a fully cashless society and that there won't be unnecessary or unintended consequences from that transition. And the great thing about these open networks is they create digital cash. So you can have the efficiency and speed to some extent of your electronic payments network, but the thing that's moving around is actually cash. It's a bearer instrument. It's something that's owned and held by a sovereign person, not necessarily something that's only described in the data center run by a corporation, a big bank, or a government. Also, we believe open consensus is critical for identity uh, applications. And identity is a broad category that you'd also extend to include voting applications and things like this, because we need to know that you're a real person, in theory, to allow you to vote. Maybe we'll have our robotic overlords vote as well, but we'll at least need to know who they are for sure. And if it's a closed system for that, it raises human rights concerns, because we don't want someone at a centralized position in a server warehouse to be able to systematically uh, de disenfranchise a number of people in the voting population. And finally, in the Internet of Things context, which is again also more of an identity usage of this technology, but one specifically related to control over devices, light bulbs, door locks, cars even, not too long from now. So this is basically what I was just describing with cash. Um, it's very important for the fungibility of the currency. It's very important for privacy related to financial transactions. It's very important for autonomy of persons making financial transactions, I think, that there be some sort of unit of account, ex medium of exchange, and store of value that is not fully under the control every time it moves of a centralized authority. I think we truly do want open decentralization to allow these financial transactions to take place. Now, that does not mean this does not come without risks, because there will come a day, in all likelihood, where we begin to notice that people we don't like are using Bitcoin to finance their activities. That's money laundering, drug networks, and it could be even more extreme. It could be things like terrorism. But it's very important that we understand that there's a trade-off here, that the alternative, a fully sanitized electronic transaction network, gives all of the control to a small number of parties who are running servers, basically. And that's a frightening reality as well. Identity systems. Now, identity is a many-faceted concept. So your identity is a bundle of a bunch of things that are in some ways true, or at least subjectively true about yourself. They're what you look like, what you've done in the past, a diploma, a certification. A lot of these things are very important to our identity, but can be basically tokenized in some way. So I could maybe be able to assert that I have certain credentials to somebody else on the network because I've been granted those credentials by somebody who grants those credentials on the network, say if someone who gives a diploma or something like that. Now, if we were to put a lot of these sorts of credentials or basically entitlements, you have an entitlement to prove that you've got a diploma, you have an entitlement to vote on one of these networks and it's a centralized network in the control of a small number of participants, then again, I think we have issues of can the network be censored? Can individuals on the network be censored? What happens if that happens? Um, it raises questions, I think, of, of human rights and human dignity, if they're not built on an open network. And finally, the Internet of Things. Um, does anyone in here have an Alexa? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good number. Is there an Alexa in the room? <laughs> I don't think so. Well, I would have already responded. People talk to these things a lot, and they do a lot of things on them. They control devices in their home. They might use them to do shopping. Um, I tried one that allowed me to order cat litter, uh, and it said, you previously ordered this brand of cat litter in this quantity. It will be $10. Would you like to buy? And 
they said yes, and that was a really strange experiment, experience, rather. Again, for competition policy, um, this, is a, this is an issue because Alexa right now, when you shop on Alexa, who are you shopping with? You're shopping with Amazon. Can you look for prices or sellers who are not on Amazon? No. And I don't expect them to open that up because, well, they built this thing and it connects to their marketplace and they make money off their marketplace. So wouldn't it be great if the marketplace was a decentralized marketplace and the hardware was just a dumb device at the edge of the network that helped you negotiate with sellers who are just on an open network globally? Um, I think that would be great. I think it'd be good for competition policy. I think it'd be good for privacy as well because there wouldn't be one centralized intermediary collecting all of your purchase information or all of your device interaction information like, oh, he just got in his car and drove to work. Oh, he drove home. Oh, maybe I'll share that with the government because they've been watching him. <laughs> and um, also, this is important for the Internet of Things because interoperability and longevity of devices is critical. So if you buy an Apple HomeKit device, you better stick to just Apple HomeKit devices. And that might be more than just devices Apple makes, a few others that have been put into that category. Um, but if you try and buy a device that's not in that category, it probably won't have a common language with your other devices. And, then you'll have multiple hubs and devices and apps trying to control your house. And this is why nobody really does this right now. This is why the Internet of Things is really still something for hobbyists and not something your average person is doing, because it doesn't work very well because it's fragmented. Now, if we had a universal decentralized data structure and consensus mechanism to determine access and control of devices, then interoperability might be easier. You'd still need manufacturers to all agree to use the same open network, or at least open networks that communicate with each other, but the barrier of having to connect with Amazon's centralized servers or Logitech's cent centralized servers would potentially be lessened. Um, with that, we've already had some really good explanations of a smart contract, but I want to give you um, a little look more closely at how I explain Ethereum to policymakers, because I think it's a pretty good entry level explainer for how Ethereum works. Um, and it also describes smart contracts, basically, and, and, and how we think of them uh, on Ethereum and other open blockchain networks. So Ethereum is, a, is another open blockchain network, as I described. And what it allows the connected computers to come to an agreement over is not actually a, a ledger of transactions. And so it's not, it's not just this person on the network sent this, these tokens to this other person on the network. Instead, it's actually the state of a global computer, which sounds weird, but I'll explain it. And it's also Ethereum, as a, as a design concept, is a platform for building decentralized apps. So it's not, it's not itself an e-cash solution or an identity solution. It is a platform that hopefully would allow anybody who can code the ability to build their own electronic cash if they thought it could be done a certain way, or their own uh, smart contract uh, application for insurance or for voting or things like that if they think it could be built a certain way. So it's an agnostic platform, just like the, the, the PC is an agnostic platform for running your applications on your local machine, and that was part of the innovation of the personal computer. And just like the internet is a fairly purpose agnostic platform for web applications, you know, Zuckerberg didn't have to get permission to build Facebook, and actually Tim Berners-Lee didn't have to get permission to build the World Wide Web and the specifications there. It's an open platform for doing anything you think might be useful on top of that lower level network. So you may say, okay, I, I understand the scribes all coming to agreement over these new pages in a book of transactions, of, of ledgers. But what would it mean to all come to agreement over the state of a computer? What, what do we mean by state? So this is a, for those of you who are technologically sophisticated, you, you're probably shaking your head and you may find this too elementary, but I think this is a good way to, to understand these things. So we all understand word processing because probably everyone in this room has written something on Microsoft Word or some similar word processing product. And it was probably an unpleasant experience on the whole, but it worked and you know, hopefully you got it in in time and everything was good in the end. Where does the application code for Microsoft Word run? If you're, you've got this software that allows you to type documents, it runs on your local computer. 
So you, you've got that software. It will allow you to type in to the keyboard and create a document with page numbers and headings and footnotes and cross-references and all that horrible stuff. And it runs on your laptop or your desktop. Now, the problem with Microsoft Word, especially the early versions, is that it makes collaboration between a bunch of people pretty difficult because you might type you know, X, Y, Z into your computer, but the other person who might want to work on the same you know, report or spreadsheet or whatever as you, it's not going to update on their machine. You're, you're going to have to save it to a floppy disk. Do you even know what that is? I'm, I'm actually old. Um, or find a way to get it to the other, the other machine in physical media, or, or you'll, you'll email it as an attachment now. And then they'll open it, and they'll, they'll see your changes, but then they'll have to make changes and send it back. It's a, it's a nightmare. It's, it's how we all used to live. Until, of course, Google Docs came along, and also the, the cloud services that are now provided by Microsoft, because they had to compete, where anybody can connect to your document as you're editing it, and uh, if you give them permission, of course. And they can make edits and suggested changes and leave comments, and it makes collaboration really easy. Now, now, how does it do that? How is this working? It's because the application code, the software for that word processor, isn't actually running on your local machine. It is, again, running in a data center. And your machine is just providing a user interface just a, a screen to show you the constantly updated state of the computation, the constantly updated state of the document. But the document is being basically created through software and your interactions on this centralized server. And you connect to it using the interface. And then other people with their other computers can, of course, connect to the same server and group edit the document. But the actual computing is happening in the server. And this gets to some issues with branding the cloud. Because this, we understand this as cloud computing. It sounds great. It sounds like there's this magical, misty thing that is helping us write documents without all the headaches of you know, doing revisions and exchanging floppy disks and things. There is no cloud. It, it doesn't exist. All there are are other computers. They're just other people's computers. And you trust those people. You trust Google to maintain its servers and to not do things that are against their terms of service or against the implied norms about using their product, you trust them to make that system work for you. But it's really just their computers, and your computer's connecting to theirs. Now let's go to Ethereum. As I said, Ethereum's blockchain describes the global state, or the state of a global computer, if you will. So, it's state, just like the server warehouse has state, when you type X, Y, Z into your Google Docs, the state of the computer that Google's running is being updated. It's similar to that with Ethereum. If you, if you were to build a word processing application on Ethereum, which I don't know would be the best use of Ethereum, but if you were, typing into the document would mean that the application code that's running that word processor is not just running on your local machine, not just running on a server that is owned by uh, a company, but actually running in parallel on every computer connected to the Ethereum network. So every scribe on this network, basically, is simultaneously updating the state of your document. And that is pretty neat from a decentralization standpoint. So instead of transactions going in the blockchain, we have computing state, and all the parties come to an agreement as to the consistently updated state of the computer. And again, this makes Ethereum a purpose agnostic platform for anybody's software. If you can write it in code, in theory, the Ethereum network can run it. And some of the other competitors or other networks that are developing the same functionality as Ethereum. Now, we use some jargon here. We tend to call uh, applications that run on Ethereum or any open network decentralized applications or dApps. It's kind of a strange word. And there are a lot of them. Um, this is uh, courtesy of a website that's consistently updated called dapps.ethercast.com. Uh, these are in various stages as prototypes or finished products. Now, when a decentralized the centralized application can also assume control over assets and mediate decisions over how those assets should be used. We sometimes call it a smart contract, basically. There is a robot that is now taking control of some asset described by the Ethereum global computer. 
It's taking control and acting as a, a functionary or an arbiter, which may obey the, the software that, that describes it. So it may say, if the rain sensors at these nodes detect that it rained in Peoria, move the money that was sent to this robot to the people who were speculating about the futures of weather for the purposes of, um, of hedging against agricultural failures and things like that. It's a smart contract. It's a robot. So you could run that on top of the Ethereum blockchain, for example. You could run that in a number of different open blockchain networks. And sometimes when these things are larger um, than just a single transaction, like this is a, a spot contract for weather futures, when sometimes it's more of an application that will take custody of a lot of people's valuables or scarce tokens or assets and create a sort of community around those things, maybe with voting rights to determine how those assets should be dispensed in the future, we have a tendency to call them decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs. That term, I don't know if I like so much anymore because there was one of these decentralized autonomous organizations that was actually called the DAO. I guess they're trying to really get, you know, like the branding. And it raised a lot of money. It was basically a decentralized venture capital fund. So you pay in, you sort of become a general partner, you get a voting right to decide where the pot of money from everyone paying in should go, which projects it should fund. Um, it raised a lot of money. There were all kinds of articles in Wired and such about people putting their life savings in because they think it's going to be a great idea. And then it got hacked. Um, because again, this is all just software. This is a decentralized application. It's like Microsoft Word. It's running. If you wrote Microsoft Word but had a bug in the code, it will break. Garbage in, garbage out is, is what we sometimes say. And unfortunately, there was a bug in the DAO that allowed somebody to systematically take a large amount of the money from the shared pool out, even though that was not something the shared pool voted to do. And of course, he, he or she, we don't know who they are, took it out to benefit themselves privately. So these things have a lot of risks. And that's where regulation comes in. Now, I've gone slower than I expected, so I'm going to cut it here. But suffice it to say, the biggest question with regards to things like the DAO or things like any kind of Ethereum application that might issue new tokens at someone's behest, so I'd like to create my own currency that travels on top of Ethereum, is that it's now 15 or so lines of code that allow you to issue this token and allow people to buy it. And you have an authoritative record of who's bought it and who has it at any given moment. And if it's got a floating exchange rate, it's kind of like equity in this thing you built. And equity is something we actually regulate pretty aggressively. You have to really, if you're going to do an initial uh, public offer of shares of your cumulative enterprise, your cooperative enterprise, you need to register with securities authorities in your given country. And in the US, the test for whether something qualifies as equity, as, as a token or a share of your security, of your uh, private enterprise, is pretty broad and could reach things like somebody who, because it's only 15 lines of code, decided to write a, a new token and sell it on a global network. And they're probably not going to register with the SEC. They may not register with financial uh, surveillance authorities. Uh, so in the US, things like FinCEN, um, but globally, anti-money laundering authorities. So what you can think about, here's the takeaway. Um, in the 90s, it suddenly became extremely cheap to violate copyright law. And that was a great thing. I mean, it, it, it actually was. The, the reason it became that cheap is because suddenly images became digital. And you could, if you had a photograph, copy it and hand it to somebody else over the internet. And we have photo sharing, we have Facebook, we have YouTube for videos. This became the massive proliferation of of important and sometimes not important, but speech. But what changed was people's ability to enforce copyright law, to say you should not share this picture or this music file or this video unless you get permission first in writing, legally. And what happened throughout the 90s, we had a number of laws that had to figure out how to deal with this new technological capability. One of the big ones in the US is called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and it says that a company that is an intermediary, like YouTube, they will not constantly be liable for the full damages of violating copyright law. 
Because if they were, YouTube would go out of business and there'd be no platform for videos. They will not be liable so long as they comply and have a notice and comment, or a notice and takedown system. So you say, hey, YouTube, that video is copyrighted content. They'll take it down. Without that change in the law, YouTube can't exist. And throughout the 90s, we saw, in the US especially, record industries and you know, the MPAA suing people who you know, took a video of their kid dancing to a, a popular song and sued that person for literally, literally millions of dollars in damages because they took that video of their kid dancing to a song and posted it on YouTube. So we had some serious growing pains when it became that easy to share content in violation of copyright law. Well, it's 15 lines of code now to issue your own stock. We're gonna have some really interesting new issues arise because of this, and hopefully we can reach the same valuable compromises we reached in the early days of the internet so that we can allow this technology to grow and flourish and not have too many people hurt in the process of inventing it. So thank you.